A few weeks ago here on BNT, we covered a story about anti-Muslim remarks, false and hateful statements that Representative Lauren Boebert from Colorado made against fellow U.S. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, representative from Minnesota. Well, Congress has decided to take action on the matter. On Tuesday, the House passed a bill that aims to tackle Islamophobia worldwide. Written by Representatives Omar and Jan Shakakowski, or Shakowski, excuse me, the Combating International Islamophobia Act would require the U.S. State Department to create a special envoy that would, quote, help policymakers better understand the interconnected global program of anti-Muslim bigotry. The bill now heads to the Senate. We'll see what happens there. Joining us now to discuss the bill and its potential impact is Sahar Aziz. She is author of the book, The Racial Muslim. She's also a professor and chancellor's social justice scholar at Rutgers University Law School. Sahar, good to see you. Welcome back to the show. Let's start with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. She continues to be at the center of anti-Muslim hate from the right. Why? You know, on Tuesday, uh, Representative Scott Perry, a Republican from Pennsylvania, falsely accused her of being affiliated with terrorists. I mean, this feels like the most just bald, uh, obvious bigotry that we've seen in recent years coming out of, out of, out of Congress. This, is, this isn't even remotely shielded or hidden. Right. Representative Han Omar's existence is resistance. Literally, the very fact that she's in the U.S. Congress is causing all these Islamophobes to just lose their mind and come out and essentially expose what we've all known, what the polls show, which is 50 percent at least of Americans hold negative, unfavorable views of Muslims. And when you look at the Republican Party, it goes up to 60 percent. And when you look at people who voted for Trump, it goes into the 70th percentile. So we have a very serious Islamophobia problem in this country. And why she wants this bill passed or why she's proposed the bill is precisely because of what not only what she's experiencing, but the three to five million Muslims in America are experiencing and the billions of Muslims are experiencing across the globe. So one of the things that we experience on a daily basis, including myself, including many other Muslim Americans, some of whom are mo among the most accomplished in their field, is constantly being accused of either being anti-Semitic, being affiliated with terrorists, being disloyal. And, the, and so not only is the, is the allegation insulting and Islamophobic, but the fact that there's no political price that you have to pay for it that Boebert can get away with it, Representative Perry can get away with it, and Marjorie Greene can get away with it, and they don't lose votes, actually they gain votes. That's really the fundamental problem, is why is it that you can be so overtly Islamophobic against not only a woman uh, representative in Congress, but millions of Muslims across the country, and there's no accountability, there's no repercussions. Yeah, I mean, so, so then the response, the repercussion, now, uh, I hope, comes through this bill, maybe. I mean, there's the, there's the issue of public sentiment. And as you pointed out, you know, and you've said before, you know, the, the response that we give, our outrage, only fuels their base. So when, when I get mad or you get mad, Boebert's base is like, look at them, they're mad. Vote for her more, right? And, and so it doesn't actually hurt them in the court of public opinion. So there has, there has to be other ways of doing it. The bill... Uh, that's passed in the Senate this week, which ostensibly is designed to combat Islamophobia. The question is, why was it, um, and not why was it needed so much, but, but, but why will it be effective, or will it be effective even? I think right now it'll be very effective because we need data. We need to document just how bad the problem is. Mm. We have an indication of that with the Pew Research Center's work that's been ongoing for at least 10 years that shows year after year these unfavorability uh, uh, data in the polls. But we also need to track the hate crimes more specifically instead of just lumping them together with religious bigotry or ethnic bigotry or xenophobia. We also need to have somebody who can change the, the public discourse, somebody that would be of that status, a special envoy in the State Department, just as the way Representative Omar right now is challenging that discourse. And we also need to include Islamophobia or combating Islamophobia as part of any kind of diversity, equity, inclusion, any kind of anti-racism work, any kind of uh, support for religious pluralism and civil rights, because right now it is marginalized at best or completely neglected at worst. 
So I think that it's important that we include Islamophobia as part of the broader conversation about inequality and anti-racism work. I also want to point out one thing that I found to be quite ironic. Many Republicans, including Republican McCall in Texas, opposed the bill because he was concerned that it would cause protected speech to be quashed, that essentially people who would be Islamophobic would somehow lose their First Amendment right to be hateful, which is not what the bill would do. But the irony is these are the same individuals who are trying to outright ban critical race theory. They're trying to ban books in schools by Black authors and Latinx authors and uh, authors that belong to the LGBTQ community. So it's quite hypocritical and just shows how much they hate Muslims is that they're, and, and how much they hate other minorities because they want to ban their books, but they want to give white supremacists or Islamophobes the platform and the freedom to be as hateful as possible without any kind of even political repercussions. Now, this uh, bill um, will look at uh, Islamophobia, both in the United States, but also abroad. Uh, I'm not sure how effective that will be, but do you see it as potentially having an impact on our foreign policy? Well, our foreign policy tends to be driven more by oil and power and military uh, empire building. However, I do think that it's important, again, to words matter, right? Discourse matters, documentation matters. And I think it's a first step for an issue that's been completely neglected. But ultimately, it's going to come down to um, politics. Is Muslims and Arabs and, and South Asians and, their, and those who are anti-Islamophobia are going to have to start voting uh, according to those values and have to get their allies to also support them so that elected officials feel that there's actually a price to pay when they uh, sign on to bills or vote for bills that ultimately perpetuate Islamophobia. But I share your skepticism in terms of will a special envoy change how the Chinese treat, mistreat and abuse the Uyghurs? Will it change what is effectively still a global war on terror that has completely dehumanized Muslims and Arabs in the middle, Muslim Middle East? That is going to be a much bigger challenge, but I think this is an important first step. And again, I think it has much more of a domestic impact right now because it is time for those who are concerned with anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism, other types of prejudice, it's time for them to stop being hypocrites and to also be equally committed to combating Islamophobia. And I also want to note that one of the ways in which these Islamophobes try to silence and try to marginalize and vilify Muslims and, and those who support their civil rights is by constantly accusing them of affiliating with terrorism, of being associated with terrorists. Mm -hmm. These vague and slandering accusations, as long as they continue to stick, as long as people actually believe that without looking for any evidence, then we have a major Islamophobia problem. And it's very strategic. You have over five, you have at least $56 million as of 2014, according to the Fear Inc. report by the Center for American Progress, $56 million was spent on uh, quashing Muslim civil rights, right, on perpetuating Islamophobia by the same organization, one of whom was the Investigative Project on Terrorism, which was now just discovered that they had a mole inside of the Council on American Islamic Relations who'd been spying on them for years to try to help Steve Emerson, the premier, you know, one of the notorious Islamophobes, to try to support his effort to essentially eliminate the largest Muslim civil rights organization in America. So this is very serious. Um, these are very serious issues, and I'm I'm glad that this bill's going through, and I hope it passes in the Senate. And it's time for America to face this very serious uh, social problem. Yeah, well, it passing in the Senate feels like a stretch to me. Feels like a long shot, even. But even having the conversation about it, I think, does something for advancing our goal of ending Islamophobia and putting a spotlight on the various ways that a bigotry and even racism, particularly drawn from the insights of your book, uh, help us uh, or, or the, the way those systems operate against the Muslim community around the globe. So, Sahar, thank you so much for your insights. Everybody, I want you to check out her book. It's called The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom. It's available wherever great books are sold, but especially independent bookstores, especially black bookstores, especially UncleBobby's.com.